So this uh, webinar uh, today is exclusively for Paul R. Lawrence Fellowship recipients. It is being jointly sponsored by Ivy Publishing and the North American Case Research Association, NACRA. Uh, we are very grateful for their support. Uh, if you've just joined us, I'm Ann Lawrence, a chair of the Case Research Foundation, which runs the Paul R. Lawrence Fellowship Program, and I'll be moderating today. Uh, let me now introduce our two distinguished speakers. Uh, Dr. Janice Gogan is Professor Emeritus of Information and Process Management at Bentley University. She holds a DBA from the Harvard Business School. She is a former president and is a fellow of the North American Case Research Association. She's also an award-winning and best-selling case author uh, with special expertise in double impact case research. Uh, Dr. Gal Raz is Associate Professor of Operations Management and Sustainability at Ivy Business School, uh, where he also serves as Associate Dean for Research. He holds a PhD from the Stanford Business School. We are very pleased to have both of you uh, with us today, Janice and Gal. So our topic today is what I think of as a kind of alchemy, uh, the medieval science of transforming one substance into another. Uh, in this case, we are talking about the alchemy of transforming research that we do to create classroom teaching cases into material for other kinds of publications, uh, ones aimed not at students, but at fellow academics, practitioners, and the public. So can we start with one thing, with one kind of research, and end up with another, thereby increasing our productivity and getting double impact or maybe even triple impact from the work we do? Janice, you've written extensively about double impact case research. Um, can you tell us what you mean by that? In the spirit of alchemy, I want to tell you that your case study data is a gold mine of information that can be uh, tapped to get double impact. So what I mean by double impact case research is um, to respond to Karen's first um, note in the chat, uh, it's true that many of our colleagues think that we go chat with somebody and we immediately write up a case, a teaching case, and it is possible to write a teaching case that way. But I advocate respecting your uh, informants and respecting the information that they share with you by using many of the same techniques that we use for any good research to ensure that we have valid results and so on, that the, that the story that we tell in our discussion cases is true. So it becomes double impact case research if you carry out your study well, well enough that you can write both in uh, impactful works that will uh, inform or guide practitioners of which the teaching case or discussion case is one of those. I used to write a column for information week. That would be another example. Certainly if you get a paper in Harvard Business Review or California Management Review or Sloan Management Review or business horizons, those would all be great practitioner outcomes. And also one or more impactful works that are going to confirm or improve theories. So I always like to start by uh, presenting conference papers because I get a lot out of the discussions with my con colleagues when I go to the conferences. And secondly, of course, we wanna aim for those uh, academic journals. So every case study in theory could produce every type of this of impact here, two, at least two different kinds of practitioner impact and at least two different kinds of um, impact on theory. I should add also that lit reviews can be uh, in that same uh, vein. Uh, can you give us an example of a time that you've done this uh, successfully? As it happens, I can. And Michael, if you could uh, show my next uh, slide. So this is a body of work that occurred um, at, uh, right around when I was getting tenure and before I got promoted to full. So the first thing that happened um, was I became aware of an important story in the news. And I should back up and say that uh, I taught at Bentley University, which is outside of Boston for most of my career. And one of the courses that I taught was accounting information systems. And in that course, uh, we teach students 
that uh, something called a control matrix is a very good way to systematically uh, document and analyze process controls and uh, controls over the information uh, associated with that process. And in accounting information systems, it's financial-based systems. But I wondered if that technique could be generalized for other purposes. And my first opportunity arose, sadly, from a really horrible tragedy that occurred in 2003. There was a young teenager, she was actually an immigrant, who uh, needed desperately needed a heart transplant. And unfortunately, the doctors implanted a heart from a donor with the wrong blood type, and she died. And that was kind of my aha moment. I thought, why can't we use the same technique that we use in accounting information systems to document the process of uh, transplants, which is actually a, an interorganizational process, and uh, identify either flawed process steps or information quality threats that can occur? And could that have saved this child's life? That resulted the first thinking on that resulted in a paper that I co-authored with my friends, Jane Fedorowitz and Chris Williams. We've co-authored quite a number of papers together. And that was in um, technology, knowledge, and society. Um, and then uh, two years, one year after that was published, um, there was another highly publicized incident, which was about actor Dennis Quaid. His uh, wife gave birth at Mount Sinai Hospital, Cedar Sinai Hospital in uh, LA, and the children were in the neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU, and uh, some nurses by mistake administered doses of adult heparin to these, these um, infants instead of the pediatric uh, dose, and they very nearly died. And in hearing about that story, I, I started digging in again because I thought, okay, this is another one that would be an example. Could a control matrix have helped avert this kind of disaster or near disaster? And I discovered that babies had been killed at other hospitals and would, be, would die again at other hospitals before this problem uh, got sorted out. So um, Scott Boss was a colleague who also taught accounting information systems. And I said, Let's use these techniques um, that, that we teach in, in AIS to analyze the, what we can learn about the Dennis Quaid twins incident. And that became um, a case that we presented um, at ISIS, um, which is um, an important, it's kind of the top conference in the field of information systems, which is my home base. And um, since I knew I was gonna be going up for a full and, I, and Scott was uh, at that time coming up, I think for um, tenure, that was uh, the outlet we chose at that time. Today, I would always choose the NACRA uh, conference, but this gave us sort of a good hit. Um, and then later on, um, we initiated a field-based case study at a, a community hospital where I was lucky enough to be introduced to the, um, the doctor, the uh, chief medical officer of that hospital. And um, he served as the sponsor for our case study where we, in, we did two full days of visits and we uh, interviewed about 17 uh, people from uh, clinicians of all types to and administrators and the IT people to uh, take a close look at medication administration processes, systems and information quality. And so that resulted in the, um, the, case, the uh, case study first presented at the Hicks conference, which is another very good conference for IP, IT people, <coughs> and to two papers in Business Process Management Journal. The first one was quite an extensive literature review, and the second one was based on uh, our theorizing from the community hospital uh, case study. So if we look at this body of work, um, it certainly looks like we um, did double impact uh, research in terms of the outputs, but I have to also confess that it wasn't really double impact research because uh, it didn't get heavily cited. I got maybe 30 or 40 citations on some of these uh, papers, and also the teaching case did not, did not end up selling that well. Um, it's, it is in the Harvard uh, system. You can take a look at it if you'd like to. 
um, but it's it's not one of my best sellers. So uh, there are lessons learned from uh, this. The positive lessons are follow the news because often really fascinating cases just fall into your lap. That was the Dennis Quaid example. It was the very tragic example of Jessica Santillan. Um, and then work with the, those uh, examples. Um, this, and I can talk more about that at other points. Um, a second one is benefit from author, co-authors who bring something to the table. Uh, Scott Boss really helped me think through the AIS uh, issues and translating them. So he was a great co-author. Whereas it turns out that um, the paper with Jim Hunton, uh, we're very, I'm very happy that we dropped him as a future co-author because he was later uh, pulled into a huge scandal. He, falsified data on something like 15 of his publication. <laughs> so that's a really extreme one. And then finally, um, the teaching, when to do the teaching case. Most of the time I write a teaching case first. It's my opportunity to think through a complex issue. In terms of publications, the teaching case got published in the middle. You can the, yeah. the Jessica Santian story was in 2003. The publication came in 2011. Uh, there's no wrong time to write a teaching case. Just make sure you discuss it once you write it. Discuss it with your students, discuss it with your colleagues, discuss it with executives, discuss it with everybody you can because those discussions help you think about the problem. And so that's my initial thoughts on double impact case research. Uh, thank you, Janice. It does strike me that I set up this problem as how you take research you've you do to create a teaching case and then develop it in other directions. But that wasn't, in fact, the process you used here. The teaching case came in the middle. And you started <laughs> with uh, a model that was used in accounting information systems, applied it in another institutional setting, healthcare. And then that drew you to a, a setting where you were able to develop a teaching case. So I think maybe a takeaway for our audience is it doesn't have to come in a particular order that you can think about teaching case research and other forms of research as an iterative and kind of back and forth process that doesn't come in a particular order. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing those um, that experience with us. Um, Gal, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, Thanks, Anne, uh, for having me. Uh, I'm very uh, excited to be here. Let me just say, uh, for me, I started uh, teaching the case method, and I would say my uh, a kind of, you know, my work with cases or my love affair with cases, maybe I should put it this way, uh, started about 15 uh, years ago. Uh, and, and I really have to say, since then, I've been teaching only with cases, you know, in the case method, both at the Darden first and uh, business school and then at Ivy. And uh, I, I don't think that I could do it any other way. And, and I think for me, I'm a big proponent of the case method and there is a reason for it. Uh, so I've, I've worked... Uh, for many years, both on developing cases, I've, I've done many tutorials uh, for it. But I think for me, it first of all comes from the basic foundation, uh, and which I, I get a chance to actually affect policy. I would say at least on the uh, Ivy level in my current role as associate dean of research. So for me, it's so natural to do something that relates to uh, doing a case and then doing a, a research paper. I actually and think that it. It goes for me most times, and I'll talk about some examples afterwards. It came to the opposite. So I started with a case and then went to a, a research paper afterwards uh, and then learned from it and, and brought it into a managerial insights coming from it. But I really think that for me, it comes from the basic understanding that in business schools, especially, but I would argue overall in academia, you have to be relevant. You have to think about the research impact. And to think about the research impact, what it actually means is. A case is a great way, not the only way. There, sometimes you do project with industry, sometimes you do other interaction with industry, but this connection between research, teaching, and industry is really uh, done well while we're using a case, using kind of, you know, uh, writing a case, working on a case, and so on. So when I think about uh, where it comes into play, and I should say now I, I, I have the fortunate enough to, to be in different hats related to that, both my work with Ivy Publishing, uh, this part of my portfolio, as well as in the research policy committee, which we approve cases for faculty. So seeing where cases play a role uh, within Ivy. And I know we're fortunate to be in a place that uh, it promotes cases and work on the case method and so on. And not all of our uh, a, a colleagues here are in this kind of situation. So we can talk a little bit about that. But when I think about why cases are so instrumental, as I mentioned, the foundation for research with impact, I think when you write cases and then your research connect to those cases, 
they're actually going to have an impact. It's not going to be read by, by five people who might be in your field, uh, even if it's a top journal, uh, but actually is going to get to many, many people, including the case sales that you get that will get to students and executives and so on. The academic, I call it the triple bottom line from my perspective, and you'll see some example afterwards because I look at, again, in most of my uh, situations and history, uh, I wrote a case that led to a research paper that went to a top academic journal and then went to a managerial article coming from it that basically introduces uh, the, the insight that we learned from building the more theory in the research paper. And now we could go back to the executive and say, this is what we learned from it. And I'll give some examples afterwards. Uh, and again, this interaction between research, teaching, and industry, which for me is a foundation of good academics uh, in business schools, especially. Uh, if we can go to the next one. So just to give you a bit of an idea, uh, I'm not going to get too much into the next kind of, you know, two slides. I want to highlight one thing. So one of the things that you do when you're uh, in, in the role of associate dean of research, I've been working a lot on thinking about how do you create research impact and how do you support our research faculty? So some of the slides that I show you now are things that we use in our strategy. In the last couple of years, we developed a new strategy uh, for Ivy. But this is actually based on Western strategy, which is the university that we're uh, housed in, that Ivy is housed in. And specifically, what I wanted to, uh, to show here is the fact that uh, when you think about mobilize for impact and what Western is trying to do with respect to research, uh, and I think many universities try to do, is this idea of how do we enhance research support? So enhancing research support, for me, a lot of time means interacting with industry, which means getting money funding from industry, which cases play a very important role. Connecting our work to the world, again, only when you do something that is practical uh, and effective, you're able to connect to the world. Uh, foster relationships, again, this connection to industry, uh, and tackle the grand challenges of our time. You'll see it in a second also in our IV kind of, you know, uh, a, a strategy. So this is the Western perspective, so the university perspective. If you go to the next slide, this is what I work on every day. So we develop a strategy that says, we will advance our goal in research. One of our six goals within the IV strategy is the advancing and amplifying world-class research with particular emphasis on confronting critical issues, what we call the grand challenges of our times. And as a big part of it, I would say, is both the idea of how do you develop forums for engagement and incentives around those critical issues, which is the third kind of you know, objective, and more, not less importantly, the translation, the dissemination of academic research to a variety of audiences. And for me, that means cases that will be used in the classroom, that means managerial article that will be used outside. Uh, so this is, again, connecting uh, how cases connect very well to research, uh, in my mind. Uh, if you want to go to the next uh, slide. So this is a, a new slide that we're using quite uh, effectively. We call it the research wheel of fortune or uh, the research life cycle, as you can see here. And, and really, one of the things that I try to look at in, in a holistic way when I uh, started my role as an associate dean uh, of research is really how do you connect and help and support faculty throughout the entire life cycle of research, which for me, and I'm sure all of you have done it uh, in your, uh, in your uh, roles, in your uh, positions as faculty members. Right, you start with research creation, going to some project planning where you have to see if you can get funding for your work, uh, going to research process itself of data gathering uh, and modeling analysis and the paper writing, and then to translation. And I would argue, and you can see, again, this is a very busy slide, and I'm not trying to get into all of it. It describes on some level uh, what we're doing uh, as kind of, you know, research department, in which we grew a lot in the last couple of years in supporting our faculty across the life cycle of research. But for me, what it also plays an important role is, you can see Ivy Publishing uh, plays a role in share and disseminate, but I would also put Ivy Publishing in the right side of research creation. Because for me, as I said, the cases play a double role in both disseminating some research if, if you start with the research process itself, but also starting the research to begin with. And you can see in every aspect here, you know, connecting to advancement, connecting to centers and institutes which we have, uh, a, a marketing communication and so on, everything is around how do we actually make sure that our research has impact. And for me, cases play a very important role. So I'll stop here. I have some examples and uh, maybe we'll talk about it uh, a bit more later, but I wanted to set the ground for how I look at it actually from an administrative level and the importance of the connection of cases and research. It's very interesting to um, hear you talk about it from the perspective of a dean. Um, I, When we had talked earlier, Gal, you shared with us a fascinating example of your work with the Eastman Corporation. Yep. And how you had generated double or triple impact research from that relationship. Could you 
talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, uh, so I think this is this is one of the the best examples. I have a few examples uh, here, and I would say, uh, as I mentioned, most of them started from uh, a, a case that developed with a company, uh, and and some of them, uh, and then afterwards turning into a research paper. And you can see here also to a managerial article in in the Washington Post. Uh, so this is a great example. Now I just should say this is something that I used uh, in my research presentations. Uh, because what you see on the top, and I think this is another important aspect about how cases play an important role, you need to see how the cases help you in delivering your research agenda, your research program. So you can see here in general, I would just mention my work has been in the last kind of you know two decades looking at government actions uh, in general, things like especially around sustainable operations, sustainable supply chain. So environmental regulation, market mechanism, how they affect firm decisions, things related to pricing, quantity, sourcing, uh, contracts, environmental innovation, manufacturing, and how they manifest themselves in a lot of time in demand models, behavioral or analytical. That's uh, uh, most of what I, I've been working on as, as a researcher and uh, how they create economic impact and environmental and social impact. So this is a nice kind of you know, figure because it can show that different papers connect to each one of those dimensions in a bit of a different way. Uh, this one, uh, it started in a really uh, interesting way because Eastman Chemicals was one of the companies uh, that, uh, so you, you might be familiar with, spun off uh, a, a Kodak uh, in a sense, and then became a much bigger company when Kodak became smaller and smaller. Uh, and it's a $7 billion company uh, in, uh, in Tennessee. And one of the things they've been trying to get to Ivy, they're trying to recruit students, uh, it, only to Ivy, to Darden. Sorry, that was a time when I was in Virginia and trying to recruit uh, a, a MBA students there and also create more collaboration. So it started by them asking us to try to create a deeper connection to them. And I went together with our uh, a director of sustainability uh, at the time, uh, some people from our, a, our career development center, which was helping around recruiting, which is one of the topics that they wanted to have. And we went there and we met with high level officials there, with the CEO, with some of the uh, VPs uh, on different aspects. For me, the, the most interesting aspect was sustainability, which is what I'm working on. And based on that, I would say it really created multiple dimensions. So on the one hand, we created a special connection to Eastman that meant that they became a partner for Darden at the time. As part of this partnership program we had with them, uh, they deserve to get a case in the taught in the first year. So one of the things that I've done in a sense, is by writing this case with them, which was really a fascinating case, and I'll mention in a second a, a bit more about it. Uh, but what it also created is a real deep connection for them with Darden, hiring students from Darden, publicizing what great about their company as part of the uh, first year, which is one of the most important places that you can do in that uh, business school. Uh, and what, what was interesting about this case is that it was the first time for, uh, for a company like Eastman, they brought a new plastic to the world. It was a big technological innovation, but at the same time, it created so many potentials uh, for going into the market, creating some, some benefits on a branding perspective, on, on really strength of their kind of you know, brand in the market with their customers. So there's a lot of different dimensions. So this case has been a really rich from teaching different methodologies. I've, I've worked a lot with news vendor models for people who know uh, with the pricing and things that it enables to teach this aspect, uh, co co collaboration and contract between different companies, as well as bringing new products to market. So it was really a very rich case. And the other dimension that was really interesting about it, all the people that were involved in that case became really high level office kind of, you know, uh, managers, executives afterwards in the company. Uh, because it was such a successful, it was a really one of the most successful initiatives in the company for kind of, you know, last 10 years. So this case that we uh, worked and were uh, kind of on it first, and you can see 2014 was when we wrote uh, a, so 2013 was when we wrote the case. Uh, we, we got the Informs uh, Award on it in 2013, and then we taught it in the first year and invited uh, the entire first year at Darden was about uh, a, a three, 400 students in, in different sections. So we had uh, six different sections. We invited the entire uh, executive team from uh, Eastman to come to our, our classes and talk about this while we're teaching the case. It was a big event for the first year. And at the same time, uh, that led to this research paper, which is a really interesting research paper that looks from the perspective uh, of manufacturers that have to decide if they want to use uh, BPA type. So this was a, a product that did not have BPA in it. So it was uh, basically taking out the substance of concern. And based on the lessons we learned from it, we afterwards were able to write also the article to the Washington Post. So for me, this was a great example of something that was both 
a real problem for the company and something that they've done that had a huge impact on them, something to be learned for our students. Uh, there was some sustainability aspect and some uh, other managerial operational marketing and so on. Uh, and also being able to afterward teach executives about what we learned from our own research. Uh, so this was a great example from, from my perspective. Well, uh, let me comment on that. Uh, Gal, you've just described what I would call a very generative and productive partnership between senior executives of a major company and um, academics at your institution at Darden. Um, I'm thinking about the relevance of this experience for our audience, many of whom are doctoral students or early career faculty. And I'd, I'd like to put the question out to both Janice and Gal, if you see this kind of process as being relevant to individuals who are earlier in their career process. Janice, you want to take that on first, and then I'll turn back to Gal. Yes, absolutely. So one of the most important things, uh, if you start with the teaching case, the, the, it's really important to set clear expectations with the person who is going to be the sponsor of that uh, case study. Um, I had one situation, it was when we were working, uh, I did a lot of cases on telemedicine, um, starting with, I think, the first teaching case about telemedicine um, a, a long time ago, and, and then picking it up again um, midway through my uh, career and doing a whole lot of other ones. And when we were working on the telestroke case, uh, I remember I had brought in a co-author who was accustomed to the more casual, slow pace of the typical academic uh, paper where you do lots of drafts and it takes forever to get the paper uh, published. And the guy who was the sponsor for the case yelled at us one day, why hasn't this you know, you said you wanted to do a teaching case. Why hasn't it been published? And part of it was our own fault. It took us, you know, uh, too long to write it for NACRA and too long to get it um, translated for, um, to be good enough to be in um, case research uh, journal. Um, and also, so it was a combination of me not having set clear enough expectations with them about how long it would take to get from gathering the information to actually having a publication that he could uh, point to because he was very proud of the work that they were doing. Fortunately, that's the, I think that's the only time I can think of in my career that I got yelled at, but um, it's a very uh, instructive one. Um, other, other examples um, just are gifts that keep on giving. I, I invited somebody to give a talk about um, something called the e-check, which was an early payment mechanism, some of the basics of that uh, design, uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, blockchains probably would never have been invented if eCheck hadn't been invented before. Um, and it was um, a consortium led uh, effort. So all I did was invite some guy from Bank of America, back then it was Bank Boston, to come and talk to my class. And from there, I had a 15 year run of, um, uh, just case after case after case and lots of uh, papers um, about internet payment mechanisms and um, the processes that they're situated within um, that um, kept me uh, working in the, uni the United States Treasury for about 15 years. So yeah, a relationship is also a gold mine. The data they give you is the gold mine and the relationship is the gold mine. But are you saying, Janice, that you think that um, doctoral students and faculty in early stages of their career can also build these relationships? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I invited the guy from Bank Boston to, to speak to my class just based on seeing something in the Boston Globe about this e-check project. And, I, and, and he was heavily quoted, so I thought, okay, let me call him up and see if he'll come and chat with my students. And he was thrilled to come out. And that led to the case study about um, the 12 pilot tests that they're trying to decide which pilot tests to start with for that particular mm -hmm. initiative and on and on and on. That was before I ever got tenure. Um, now, mind you, um, I had great mentoring as a student at Harvard Business School that's what my supervisor did. He saw my, my very first case that I ever wrote on Blue Shield of Massachusetts. It was my supervisor, Les Porter, who um, 
saw an article in the Wall Street Journal and called up. Sure. Now there, we also knew if you're gonna call anybody, always make sure, do they have any Harvard connection? I'm sure Gal does that with anybody, you know, you check to see, is there a Stanford connection or is there an Ivy connection or is there a Darden connection? Because those, those alumni are very loyal. So if there's somebody who can introduce you to the person, you try to do that. But he just did a cold call to the guy that was quoted in the paper. And that was also before he actually didn't get tenure, but um, that particular supervisor went on to um, um, uh, University of Southern California, he did fine. But so yeah, we, we did that all the time. And I, and I strongly recommend it. And then just make sure you honor your commitments to them and, and that you're clear about what the process is gonna look like. And Gal, how do you pull doctoral students and early career faculty into this process? So I, I would say, first of all, and, and this is, a, I know Ivy is a unique place uh, on some level, but we are very much encourage our, uh, P, both our PhD students. And I, when I say encourage, it means that we're also supporting workshop for them to learn about case writing uh, and case teaching, as well as our junior faculty that, uh, that arrived and maybe have not uh, taught in case method before, both about writing and teaching. So we have uh, Ivy workshop that they, they go through in order to do that. But more importantly, uh, I, I think one of the nice things about you know, the IV uh, specifically, and again, I, I've, I've done uh, a work for other uh, a case collections also, is the fact that you can be anywhere in the world and you can publish an IV case. And I think this is really important because it means that that gives you an opportunity to interact with people that will review your case, look at your cases, give you feedback, and then you have something that you can point to. Now, I should say, you're right. As a junior faculty, you know, publishing the academic research is going to be the number one thing that people will look at. Although I think today, and I see it from discussion with many of my co kind of colleagues, administrators in other places, you know, associate deans uh, and, and chairs and, and in other in other kind of you know, department chairs and so on, they look at things like cases. This is something that is also important. So it's not it's not that if you have you know five cases or ten cases, you'll be able to get tenure based on it. Of course not. But if you have you know some cases and you also have research papers and those things are connected exactly how we kind of you know we talked about it before. So it's not that you write a case independently, but the case is kind of you know leading you to afterwards your research papers. It shows your ability to actually have an expertise in a topic. So you learn, you work with a company, you get expertise on a specific topic and understanding. In addition, it shows also with your research paper. I would argue it helps you publish the paper itself because in many of our journals in operations at least, you know, if it's management science, Amazon, Palms, and others, they're very much looking for what is the, mo the motivation for the paper. If mm -hmm. you're just trying to tell a story about something, or maybe you're looking at something, an article from the newspaper, that's nice, that's great. But if you actually have a real case that you wrote, and this is your motivation, that's going to much more help you in being able to publish afterwards. So I think that for me, this is not an either or. This is, oh, if you write cases and you're working on teaching cases, that's going to hurt you. You don't have time for research. It's part of the process, and it should actually make you a stronger candidate for, uh, first of all, to get a job, and afterwards, a candidate to get tenure. That's very well put, Gal. Thank you. That's an important message for us to get. Um, the two of you have both been discussing the sort of interaction between writing a teaching case and um, more traditional academic research. Um, I'd like to take a moment to say a few words about uh, my own work. Um, I've used a somewhat different approach to using teaching cases uh, to build theory. So I'd like to share, ask Michael to just share a few of my slides and kind of bring a slightly different perspective into this. So I've, um, <clears throat> I have done something a little different. Um, I have used existing teaching cases, not my own, but existing published teaching cases to build theory. And I've given you a reference here um, that you can track down the article if you wish. Um, so this process involves uh, defining a research question. Uh, in my case, uh, I was interested in what strategies managers use to um, in disputes with non-market stakeholders. So I was interested in what strategies managers use, uh, why do they use one strategy rather than another, what strategies are most effective. And I then went out and searched the databases of existing teaching cases. So I went through all the major, um, the Harvard collection, the Ivy collection, uh, the case research journal, um, European case clearinghouse and so forth. I went through all the case databases and I found 
uh, 24 teaching cases that were about the situation that I was interested in studying. And I did a deep dive into those 24 cases and used them to uh, generate a typology of strategies and then to develop a set of testable hypotheses about under what conditions managers would pick one strategy or another and under what conditions they would uh, be likely to be effective or successful. Um, if I could just go on to the next slide, Michael. Um, the, the advantages of this method are that you get access to a large amount of rich ethnographic field data on topics of interest without the prohibitive cost of collecting it directly. I think that cases are in fact a very rich mine of ethnographic data that has not been fully exploited by academic researchers. I think this method is useful for typology generation and for theory and hypothesis generation. The disadvantages, obviously this data was not collected for the with the researcher's question necessarily in mind. So uh, they may not, these cases may not include all the data that one would have collected oneself if you were out there doing your own research. Um, and they're certainly less useful for testing hypotheses. This is not a, a hypothesis testing method, but I would just um, throw that out there as uh, a possible methodology for using cases. Um, this has not been widely used. In fact, I think, to my knowledge, I'm the only person who has done this. But my reviewers were very, I thought I wouldn't get it published, but in fact, my reviewers were very enthusiastic about this paper. But I'm putting it out there in hopes that maybe someone else will try it. Okay, let's, um, so we've kind of, we, we've heard from three people now um, about some of these possible synergies, we'll call it, between uh, developing teaching cases and other kinds of research. Um, I'd like to open this up uh, to questions and discussion. And uh, if you'd like to participate, please uh, type a question into the chat and we will bring you into the conversation. So Anne, there were, there were two questions earlier um, that okay. we touched on. Mm -hmm. um, Maria asked a question about uh, resistance and uh, Janice referred a little bit to building that relationship and, and flagging early the uh, potential outcomes of the research. So Mar Maria's question there was about resistance to having multiple kinds of output and perhaps disguising information along the way. So at what point does that get raised when it's not just a, ca just a case study that comes out? And then Karen's uh, comment a little bit later uh, about how this kind of work might be seen within business schools and without. Uh, Karen, maybe you want to expand a little bit on, on how I'm summarizing your question. But I think Janice wanted to pick up on the first one. Yeah, I was going to say that um, in my own work, I've always, there's a practice I have always used that is not quite what IRBs want their professors to use. I tell my case sponsor that I'm like a journalist, and but everything remains off the table until they allow me to put it on the table. So for me, um, I, I always, if I'm starting with the teaching case, I just start with the teaching case. And then I build trust with my uh, sponsor because every interviewee gets to see if I want to quote them from the, you know, I, I always record all my interviews and I produce transcripts from them. And that's easier to do now that you, if you, um, know how to use um, closed caption soft software, by the way. Um, but so I always ask my interviewees, uh, do, you, do you allow me to quote you? This is what you said. This is what I want to put in this teaching case. Do, will you allow that? And then we also have a process where um, the sponsor reads the entire case and uh, signs off on it. And until that happens, I can't publish the case. But because I've done that for them and they recognize that I'm really protecting their best interests all the way along, um, I have never had um, a problem. I've had a couple of, of cases stop before I got to publish anything because the, in some cases there was a strike, a labor strike, and they decided this was not a good time to uh, write a case about a merger between two companies because the, the uh, union was concerned about losing jobs. And another time, 
uh, it was a company that uh, realized from, from looking at drafts of the case that we actually thought that what they were doing was highly strategic. <laughs> and they decided they didn't want to share it with the world. But um, <clears throat> you know, that's out of, I don't know, I think I've written something like 40 cases. So that, that's not too bad. Um, I'm seeing a question from Karen. Um, Wait, Amy, can I yes. comment on, on sure. this? So, so yeah. I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> and, and I know Janice also mentioned before, kind of, you know, they're using data for both the case and the research. I, I do want to caution, again, part of my role, uh, a, kind of, you know, my current role, I mean, we're in charge of uh, ethics for our faculty, and we have a lot of interaction with that ethics in the university. Cases have a very different, and again, it might, might be Western, but I think this is overall, and especially in Canada. So I found Canada ethics kind of, you know, rules and RV are very different also than the U.S., uh, much more uh, stringent in this type of thing. So even things like Qualtrics survey or things like that sometimes go through kind of very big scrutiny. I would argue there is a challenge with it, and I don't know that this is how it's supposed to be, but this is one of the things that we're dealing with. And there is a big difference between cases. So cases do not have to go through this in general, if they're using for teaching. However, if you are doing research based on that, so if you're trying to use then data that you collected while doing for a case, there might be some challenges. Again, I'm talking more in Canada. I haven't found as much in the US uh, challenges there, but in Canada, it's a big challenge. So you can't technically use like, you know, do a case and collect information and data and then try to write the research paper. And then the question is, well, but did you do the uh, IRB? Did you do kind of, you know, the ethics uh, before approval and all that? So uh, which you can do also, so you can do the ethics approval. It will take you uh, longer and you don't need it for the case itself. But I just want to highlight this again for faculty uh, or PhD student that might be uh, dealing with something like that. Just make sure you check uh, with the people in charge at your university, kind of, you know, what are the challenges there? Uh, I, but but overall, I would say also on the, the issue I have done in the past, I, again, I use the case as, as a case or some other activity that I had uh, similar, like a simulation that I've used in the past. I use the data as giving me some information to start the analysis, but not as something that I actually use in the paper itself as, as a data that afterwards I'm presenting to the, uh, to the journal afterwards. Thanks, Gal. Um, Karen had asked a question earlier about the relevance of this discussion to um, academics who are working in non-business school settings. And Karen, could you remind us um, what kind of institution you're in now? So, uh, hi, Anne. And yeah, I hi, must Karen. say, it is really lovely to see everybody. It has been such a long time. So thank you for organizing the webinar and bringing us all together. So it, it really is lovely to, to see you all. Um, I joined the London School of Economics, so there's a lot of interesting case teaching, and I think there's lots of different interpretations as to what um, case teaching actually is. But one of the things I keep coming up against is the sense that it's a business school approach, and it's limited mm -hmm. to business schools, and, and then in some way makes it, um, I mean, I don't want to misrepresent the university, but you kind of get this undertone that it's slightly a lesser approach. And so uh, if there's any advice, because I think this kind of double impact research approach could be a very useful way to position case research within the university itself. But also I appreciate that there might be a risk attached to that, that if I go, hey, you can get, you know, do data collection for a case and we could possibly publish out of it. And if that publication doesn't happen, then that might further diminish the legitimacy of, of case research. So. Really, my question is probably a bit broad, but I would really appreciate some thoughts from the panel as to how do you build the legitimacy of, of cases within a more traditional university environment and um, how we can navigate some of those risks attached to this kind of double research approach that, that is being promoted here, which I think is valuable, but it would be good to know what we need to guard against. Thank you. Janice or Gal, you'd like to take that on? Sure. Uh, so. I mean, let, let me say, first of all, I, I cannot imagine a situation where a lecture method would be better than a case method in any situation. It doesn't matter if you teach history or you teach uh, biology or literature or, or you're teaching uh, in business school. So, so I, I actually think that one of the challenges is that we're so used to this, I would argue, uh, lesser uh, a, a view in a sense, which is a lecture method where people are just, a professor is standing and talking to students, which half of them are on their phones and doing other things. And at the same time, this is what we use because it's easy to do. Because for faculty who try to focus on research, oh yeah, I'll just have my slides, like I had in the last 20 years, the same slides, and I'm just gonna talk about them. 
but I can, I've seen and talked to, to, uh, to faculty members and to, I would say even teachers that teach, you know, uh, a history, that teach uh, a literature. Uh, there is so many creative ways of teaching like a case method approach, right, in, in history and thinking about having people, different people playing at different roles uh, within the classroom of, you know, of, of uh, ne negotiating or talking from the different historical uh, figures, right? So even in this kind of situation, if you asked me, I could go to any uh, type of topic and think about how would you do it in a creative way that would be a case method method like. So first of all, I would want to put that aside. I know it's easier. It's uh, somewhat, you know, the approach that it is many, many places in academia, but I would definitely not say it's lesser. I think it's very easy to prove and there is a lot of research to show why case method is superior. So let's first put that kind of, you know, on the side. It does require at the beginning more investment because to understand how you do this well and to think about it. But for me, it actually really showed the connected teaching and research, which is another problematic issue in academia. The fact that people see them as siloed, you have to do your teaching and you have to do your research. And those two things should not be connected. I've learned so much by teaching executives cases, not even cases I've written, even cases that other people have written, that made me think about research problems afterwards and talk to those executives to do project maybe with undergraduate students or other things in order to get to afterward the research paper. So we're not just talking about cases per se, but I think the discussion of cases allow you to get to deeper connection research. And I think for me, that's, that's part of the discussion and it has to change our overall kind of dialogue also. I know when it's tougher where, where you are, I can tell you, I, I was a junior faculty, I was a PhD student. It wasn't always to come and present those ideas that I believed in and I kind of went to the different stages, part of being part of committee that trying to raise those issues and then now being able to actually do things and get them actionable. I think this is, you know, it's a, it's a long journey, but I think that you have to also believe in what you're doing. And I think this is absolutely the right approach and the right way to do research in academia in general, it doesn't matter if you're in economics, we have a lot of economics colleagues uh, in the business school, but they're in a, they're economists and they're doing research exactly the same way. They start working on cases, they work with industry and they generate research, top research, you know, from it. So, I mean, obviously I'm I'm already kind of, you know, a big uh, believer in that. So that's, it, it's tough, uh, uh, but I've had a lot of discussion with many people, including different levels of the organization. And I can tell you that overall, the arguments are there. It's just that it's not always easy to make them, of course, depending on where you are. I would add three thoughts. Uh, two are specific to economics. So if you wanted to take a look at other universities, uh, cases on in courses uh, on business, government, and society. A lot of those are really trying to teach students how to do economic analysis. At Harvard, that course was called Business, Government, and the International Economy. So you can see examples of cases like that. And also in economics, you know, you've got this whole trend of behavioral economics. It seems to me there's lots of great um, teaching cases that could really bring out the insights that are that are explored in that. Uh, stream. And then the third uh, point is not so much about economics, it's about boards of trustees and alumni. If, if you're at a school where anybody has ever been in a case method school, though, and, and those people show up on the board of trustees, mm -hmm. they are super excited when they see <coughs> teaching cases on your, you know, on your um, Vita. So they're, they're not usually weighing in on whether or not you're going to get tenure, but when they find out you did, they're like, now there's somebody who knows how to actually talk to real managers. So don't be afraid of including at least a few cases in your portfolio. And very good, can I very just good. One, more, one more point I wanted to make. So I, mm -hmm. so one of the uh, also a very successful, I would say, uh, case, it was actually a simulation that I uh, designed and relates very much to economics. So that's why I, want, I wanted to raise it. Uh, so I developed a simulation. People know that the beer game probably uh, is, is a, a well-known simulation. I developed a version of that called the supply chain game when it's not just individuals kind of in a sense uh, a, a competing, but it's actually you competing groups uh, where you're competing on price and quantity, very much related to my research on price and quantity, uh, a, a, a kind of, you know, be between both competitive as well as individual companies. And one of the things that we found, so I developed the simulation uh, when I was done, and then we ran the simulation for many years with executives as well as, you know, with students. And we found a really interesting result, which is usually you think basic economics, more firms in the market, the price is going to go down. We found that by having more firms in the market, the, the price actually goes up. And it relates to the fact that you're deciding on both price and quantity. So it's what's called inventory risk uh, that you have to take into account. Again, I, we can talk about it for a long time. We don't have the time. But I just want to mention that because we've done it in the classroom, 
We found this phenomena by running those games and simulation that I designed in the classroom. And then we went, we said, hey, that doesn't make, you know, does it make sense? And let's try to understand it more. And then we developed the theory for it and we were able to develop and write a research paper uh, that we published last uh, year in, in Decision Sciences, uh, which is a very uh, strong journal in operations. So, so I think that, again, this is an example of something that's very much related to economics. We would have never found it if we haven't actually done a simulation game and some activity that we've done in the classroom. So teaching really led to research uh, that led to a really interesting kind of, you know, result. And afterwards, we also had some managerial articles around it. So again, I think this, this, all those things have to be connected. Caleb asks, I think, a, a really important sort of central question to this discussion. He says, for a research case, theoretical contribution is the key. Yet when we develop a teaching case, especially decision focused, it might be more practical. That is often a challenge to me. Any suggestions on that issue? Um, I'm going to tell a little story here. Um, my dad, uh, Paul R. Lawrence, after whom the fellowship is named, is, uh, was known for his theoretical contributions, particularly contingency theory. But he always told me that every single theoretical insight that he ever got any traction with, he got when he was in the field doing case research. Every single theoretical insight he ever had, he had in the field. And that's that's the insight that uh, getting out there in the field is tremendously generative of important theoretical ideas. Well, I I can't agree with you more about the the value of talking with people, with managers who are struggling with their uh, their problems, and um, that is how you develop practical useful yeah. theory. We have, we have plenty of, um, we, there are just way too many studies out there that beat a theory to death. In my, in my field, it's the, um, uh, the technology um, adoption model um, that is just, you know, everybody works with the, they, they, they make incremental changes uh, to it and, um, you know, it's just yet another of the, the same thing. And the great thing about cases is that they always reveal new angles. I, I can't say I, they always get me um, doing great theorizing, but, it, but I sure get curious and puzzled about them. And um, that I think also is where co-authors are so important. Um, it's really important to try to find co-authors who take a different perspective than you do because it's the, it's the um, maybe the discussions that you have during the case study that generate the work. And that's something I've seen in um, some very famous examples. Sumantra Ghoshal has a whole conference named after him. It's the Ghoshal Conference on Research Rigor and Relevance. And he and Chris Bartlett had uh, legendary arguments about what they were seeing. And they, and they loved having those arguments and they had highly, highly impactful research. So I'm not sure that's really answering the specific question, but I wanted to sneak it in. So let me just, just echo this on some level, but I do think that one of the fascinating things that you get in cases is, again, if you just go and, and work on other people's research and see kind of you know what other people are doing and try to extend it and so on, which is sometimes a more safe way uh, to go, you're not going to get to the most interesting questions. But a lot of times what I found is I go to, a, to write a case thinking that I know what the problem is. I know what the company is trying to achieve. And when you go and start talking to them, you find that it's completely different. So the actual problem they're facing is something completely different. And the reason why they've done it is different, which makes you then start thinking differently about the case, which then would lead to different research, which you have never got to before if you haven't kind of you know, gone through this process. So I think that's really important also. Uh, we are now close to the end of our hour. I would like to thank our two distinguished panelists, uh, Janice Gogan and Gal Raz, for sharing their long professional experience and insights with us. Um, I'd like to thank Ivy and Necker for sponsoring this conversation. And I'd like to say how wonderful it is to pull together uh, such a great group of former PRL fellows uh, to engage with us in this conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we will hope to do more of these webinars and professional development experiences for you in the future. Thank you so much.